Well, we've been um, studying the book of First Peter over the last few weeks, and we have gone as far as verse 12. There's lots of juice in this letter. Peter was commissioned by the Lord Jesus to be the encourager of the brethren. And my goodness, after 2020, we needed a letter of encouragement to the brethren. Do you agree? <laughs> we sure did. So for the first 12 verses, Peter is encouraging. You are chosen. You are redeemed. You have an inheritance that goes on forever and ever and ever. And you will be made right with God um, as time progresses. And there's this beautiful letter of encouragement. So right up to verse 12, it's exciting and it's encouraging. And then we get to verse 13. And there's a word. If you open your Bibles to 1 Peter 1 and verse 13, I want you to have a look at the very first word. And most of you will see the word, therefore. And I learnt when I was at college with um, Dr. Young, who remembers Norm. I'm sure a few of you remember Norm. Yeah. Norm was a character all of his own. Norm said, when you see it there for, you've got to check out what it's there for. <laughs> so that was his thing. We always had to check out what the therefore was there for. And so you always look back. And so we look back very quickly over the first 12 verses and we see encouragement. Now, before we get into the word, let's pray together. Will you bow your heads? Because I really need God's help to deliver this, this message this morning. Father in heaven, you are amazing. And as we pause in your presence over this letter, that this man that you reestablished as your apostle after he had fallen so low, we realise that he understands getting back up on your feet and, and living a life um, that brings light to all those that you encounter. So we can take it for granted. This man, because of you, understood what we're going through. And he understands what it's like to stand in that gap, linking a dark world to the light that you bring. And so, Lord, we want to pause and read his letter and we want to get closer to you. And may, at the end of this time, we feel not just informed but transformed by your word. We love you so much. Amen. So, Peter says, therefore, so all this lovely encouragement, he says, because you know all this stuff, and if you weren't with us for the last couple of weeks looking over the verses 1 to 12, he said, you are chosen, you have living hope that will go on and on, and you have an incorruptible inheritance, and this will go on forever and ever, and if that didn't encourage you, um, he said, you have something that is so wonderful that the angels ponder the righteousness of God and what he's done for us. And then he says, so then, I'm in the, the Passion Translation, so instead of therefore, I get so then. So I'm in verse 13, prepare your hearts and minds for action. Stay alert and fix your hope firmly on the marvellous grace that is coming to you. For when Jesus Christ is unveiled, a greater measure of grace will be released to you as God's obedient children never again shape your lives by the desires that you followed when you didn't know better. Instead, shape your lives to become like the Holy One who called you. For Scripture says, for it is written... You are to be holy because I am holy. Since you call on him as your heavenly father, the, imp the impartial judge who judges according to each one's works, live each day with holy awe and reverence throughout your time on earth. Whew. That's a lot to be there for, isn't it? Live your life as holy. So we know that darkness and light are metaphors for evil and good. And Peter's going, I want you to be transformed from where you were to what God is calling you to be. And I love that video, those little light things. And, and I think of a story that I read of um, is Robert Louis Stevenson. But he was in Ireland. And the, um, if you remember, the streetlights used to have to be lit they didn't all just come on automatically like ours do at dusk. They had to get up on the ladder, lift the glass and light the gas lamps. 
And as a boy, he's looking out the window and he goes, they're poking holes in the dark. So I want to call on you, Christian. Can you poke some holes in the dark? And that's what, that's what Jesus is calling us to do, poke holes in the dark. Are you up for it? Yeah. So he gives us some really good ways to do it. Um, in the first part where he says, I think in some of your translations it might say, gird your loins. Gird your loins, it's pretty strange, isn't it? It kind of sounds a little bit freaky for us girls. We can, what, what, what are we going to do that for? Um, but if we think back 2,000 years when men were wearing robes and what they would do, robes were great. They were practical and comfortable and all that sort of stuff. But if you wanted to walk or run or do, you know, do something fiddly or, or get over and work, they had to pick them all up and tuck them in their belt. So <laughs> gird your loins. I guess a modern translation of gird your loins or the loins of your mind, would be pick up everything that flaps around and would stop you from doing what God wants you to do. And we could say, roll those sleeves up. Get ready. Get ready. I've got something important for you to do. Prepare. Like, you, you kind of get ready for work, don't you? You kind of wear your different clothes. You don't wear these sorts of stupid things that hang in the place because if I'm trying to mop up the floor, I'd have things hanging in it, which wouldn't be very good. So gird your loins. Get ready. Tuck everything in. Put all the things that flap around and get ready for what God is calling you to do. So he says, prepare your mind. So to pre your mind is the beginning of everything. In Proverbs we're told, think, think clearly, gird up your mind because you have to think sober thoughts. Your mind is the beginning of everything, isn't it? If you make your mind up, who's tried to do a New Year's resolution this year already? You have. Have you been successful so far? Okay, it's dodgy already. And what date are we? The 16th. Um, so most of us do, we don't we? We go, yeah, let's, let's do something exciting. Let's lose weight. Let's jog every morning. And then the weather's like this and you go, mm -hmm, no, nah, I'm not doing it today. Let's, um, let's only eat um, things that are healthy. Let's clean eat. And then somebody makes you a cake and has it delivered for your anniversary. You can't let that sucker go to waste. You have to taste it, don't you? You just do. It, it just... So you know that it, you have, your mind is a really powerful thing. But we get really sidetracked. We really need God to get our mind in a focused position. So, so Peter's going, you, you need to get straight. Think clearly. What is the most important thing that we have before us? And it is to get your mind straight. To punch holes in the darkness, your mind has to be about it. And then you have to shape your conduct. So think about what you... I don't know. If, how many... Can I have a show of hands? How many have been Adventists since birth? Like brought it up that way. Okay. How many of you were um, converted into the church and had an old lifestyle? Okay. Only a few of you. Okay. So... There's, a, there's actually a time for us, even if we're raised in the church, where you have that aha moment, where you look and you see Jesus' face for the first time. And you kind of, it, it's a transformation, isn't it? I was talking to John, I hope he doesn't mind me um, using his story, but he said when he became a Christian, it was like somebody let him out of a box. Um, and there's this, this freedom, this release that is just so joy-filled and if you look back to where you were, and particularly if you've had a hard life or been you know, down some tough tracks, you realise that this life that God gives you is so much more, so much freer, you know? People go, oh, I like to be free and I like to drink and smoke and do whatever. But that's rubbish. I've actually heard Christians boast about the old times, the good old days of parties and stuff. Um, Paul tells us in First Corinthians, or sorry, in Ephesians, what it was really like. Before Jesus, you were dead. You were dead. And not only that, you were the target of God's wrath because he, he doesn't hate you, but he hates the sins that engulf you. You're addicted. So let's not fool ourselves that the old life of sin is not fun. You ask anybody that has witnessed 
addiction and hurt and pain and tendencies of self-worth where they don't they want to commit suicide and things like that. You ask those people and you realise the old life was rubbish. And Peter says, leave it behind. It's not worth anything. Learn to say no and walk away. So there were things that you used to do before Christ that you should no longer do. Um, it was really interesting when I was growing up. We used to have a, a term that was um, secular and sacred. Have you heard that? Sacred concert, secular concert. And we had this kind of line down the middle. So if we were going to do that, you guys could be sacred and you guys could be secular. Naughty, naughty things over this side. And this was sacred. Um, and, and you had a real fine line. So when the sun went down on Friday night, you put away all your albums that were um, not, didn't have Jesus in them. So, you know, you would hide ACDC maybe. <laughs> I don't know what you listen to, but whatever you were listening to, you'd hide all that stuff away. And then at Sabbath, you'd bring out all the heritage singers and that kind of stuff. Um, and, and we actually, at Lilydale, because we had vinyl albums back then for the young people, they were great big discs about this big, and you put a, 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 a needle on them and they would play music. <laughs> Um, and so we used to have stamped, because when I first went to Lilydale, you were actually allowed to have a little record player in your room. We abused the privilege by making them way too loud, so they were all confiscated, and you weren't even allowed to have a transistor by the time I was there for two years. So anyway, you could have records. And they would have a look at all your vinyl albums and tell you which ones were for Sabbath and which ones for all the other times. And as I was thinking about that this week, I'm thinking something changed in me when I had that aha moment with Jesus. What changed was I didn't have different music for playing at different times. I started to choose music that was going to fill me up with the Holy Spirit every day. Every day. I started to choose things that were going to be um, to lift me up. Every day, and I think that's what Peter's saying. We don't, we shouldn't have two sides of us, we're all his. Don't you want to be all in? So it means there's music you don't listen to. If it doesn't lift you up and build you and, and give you purpose, put it away. If there's websites that bring you down, don't go there, don't compromise, don't compromise. Don't think, look, I can make a balance of this, get rid of it. Your eternity, your eternal life is, is impinged with this. To live as a person of the light, you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit every second of every day. I don't want to, I don't want to touch my feet to the floor without inviting the Holy Spirit in. And that means making choices that everything you do, we should never secular and a sacred. We should just have Jesus. Jesus in everything so that whatever Whatever, wherever the sun is in the sky on a Friday or a Saturday, it doesn't matter. We're focused on him, yeah? Does that make sense to you? And, and I, I love that. Um, I think the variety of Christian music that we have now have made it so that young people can have a variety of music that has a good message. They don't have to look anywhere else if they want to beat. And they can have all styles of music. You can have jazz or any style of music you want with a Christian message and you can have films with a Christian message and you shouldn't just go to a film um, just because it looks cool or because it's popular. Make choices. Is that going to fill me up? Because the things that go in your eyes and in your ears, you can't get them out. If you've mistakenly looked at something you shouldn't, have you ever tried to get it out of your head? It's like saying, don't think of pink elephants. What are you all thinking about? I know. It's terrible, isn't it? You need to fill yourself up. And we do it for the kids. We have um, ratings on TV shows, and the kids are always hanging out to get, oh, can I see PG now? <laughs> and then they're waiting. And a, a lot of kids that are young, and because I was a chaplain for so long, a lot of kids were think, seeing things with M and all that stuff on, on their games and on their movies, and I was horrified. Because those things there are to protect minds and eyes and spirits to be closer to the Lord. And when that is taken away, it's kind of sad. Innocence is lost. You know, that's what happened in the Garden of Eden. Innocence was lost. 
Taking a piece of fruit wasn't going to offend God, but leaving somebody else was right above him offends God. When God says, this is right for you, not that, and we go, I'll take that, thank you very much, that's what offends him. A piece of fruit isn't going to offend him. So when they say, okay, I'm going to believe the enemy, so the enemy with all the advertising and all the stuff on his side saying, come and watch this, come and do that, we need to just say no. No. Because it steals our innocence, it steals our closest to Jesus, and my goodness, I don't want to lose that. And it's cool to be a follower of the Lord Jesus. And when we think he is holy, we kind of, um, we, we think, you know, holiness is a bit of a strange word. What is holy? If I said to you, what's holy? What, what kind of things would you say now? Would you picture, you know, cathedrals with candles and him music playing in the background, would that be holy to you? Or would it be, you know, some beautiful choir singing, the Mormon tabernacle choir singing? Or what would it be? What would holiness look like to you? Um, and what it really means is uniqueness, godness. You know, when it says God is holy, 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 it doesn't say God is love, love, love. That's one of his attributes. But holy means he's unique. And there's, there's something amazing about him. And if we serve a unique and amazing God, then we need to have a family, a family resemblance, yeah? If we're children of the living God, we need to look like God. And we need to have that holiness. What does that mean? Don't judge others. Be loving. Be kind. Have the attributes of God. Be holy. Be separate from that. Be unique. Don't go with the rest of the world and get angry and frustrated and, and think of, you know, dirty thoughts and yucky, violent thoughts. Think of different thoughts. Have a higher plane of your mind where that's going to go. Have a family resemblance to our Lord and Saviour. So that's what holiness means. And, and have a family resemblance. It's very important. There's a story of Alexander the Great. Um, and, and he found a young man who was, who was, you know, running away from, from battle. And so he was brought in and he was brought before the emperor. And the emperor said, son, what is your name? And the young man said, I'm Alexander. Alexander the Great was quite disturbed by a young man with the same name as him. And he said, young man, you need to change your behaviour or you need to change your name. So I'm going to say this to you, that if you say, I'm a Christian, change your behaviour or change your name. Because Jesus needs you to be Christian, Christ-like. And that's what he's calling us to be. So to be a light in the darkness, he wants you. Um, and, and the only way we can do it is to plug into the power. He doesn't ask us to do it alone. Um, I was reading a story about a young man from Africa who uh, came to the city and saw lots of lights. You know, lights were just so light bulbs everywhere. So he had a bit of extra money, so he bought lots of light bulbs and sockets. And he got back to his village and he strung them up everywhere. Um, and people were going, what are you doing? <laughs> this is strange. <laughs> just light bulbs all over your, your house and all that kind of stuff. And he's going, you just wait till night time. It's awesome. You just wait till the dark. And, um, and the poor guy, the dark came, and he flipped the switch, but nobody had told him that he needs power in all of this. Um, and, and we need that power. To be able to put our light on to start with, we need power. And, and he gives it to us, and that's so an awesome thing. The third thing we need to live a life of holiness is to focus our will to be determined, and it says in verse 15, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. So it doesn't say in some of the things you do. It doesn't have a partial holiness. It says in everything you do. You know, God wants access to every room of the house. He wants to live as he wants to live as a resident in your life, not as a tourist. You know, if you've ever done any tours of beautiful old mansions and stuff, there are rooms that are partially, you know, partial, they put ropes up so you can't go in. So, um, but we don't want that for Jesus. We want every access. So, you know, in the living room, what, whatever's going on in there, in the dining room, in the kitchen, in the bedroom, in the bathroom, everywhere we go in our lives, at work, at play, he wants full access to everything we are. There shouldn't be um, one you know, our, 
holy side and our secular side. We don't have that. He wants access to everything we do because that's shining a light. In the darkness where you are, whatever you do to earn a living and to put food on the table has to become part of the fabric of your Christian life. It's not just what you do from sundown on Friday night to sundown on Saturday. It's really important that you have um, the attributes and the holiness of God in every aspect of your life. And um, verse 17, since you call on him as your heavenly father, the impartial judge who judges according to each one's works, live each day with holy awe and reverence throughout your time on earth. So you need to have a, like a, a deeply held conviction. It's not just, oh, I'm a Christian. It's kind of much deeper than that, isn't it? It's, it's a change of life. So, and, and why? Why do you want to do that? Because it says, it is written. The Bible is the written word of God. Just think of that for the impact for a minute. You know, you plant it on this planet and it's really easy to tra-la-la through life and skip through everything and, and not really think of the impact of this. But the living God that created everything that we can see, hear, breathe, or says to you in his written word, I want you to follow me. You're really, really important. You are the most valuable thing on the planet. Even the angels are in awe of what we have. And he says, I want you to live a better life. So focus on me and put aside all things. And because I say it in my word, and that should be enough. Like I know sometimes you read parts of the Bible, it can be a little bit confusing, right? Ponder over it. You know, if you really want to learn, I've read manuals that drive my brain insane, um, particularly as COVID came and I had to learn to do things that I hadn't done before as far as online church and all those sorts of things, how to do Zoom properly and all that kind of stuff. And they, they send a manual. It sucks, right? Who hates them? I, I know lots of guys don't even read them. You just make it up as you go along. And you might get away with that with something from, you know, Ikea or something like that. But when it's electronic and there's all these things that you, you know, processes, you need to read the manual. So I'm reading manuals going... I've rung Mikey Edgren quite regularly. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but I don't stop because my desire is to be able to do what this program, what this app offers that I can do. I want to have the maximum impact with it. So I stick with the manual, even though it's a bit tough. So some of the things of God you might need, you know, five reads through. I've read manuals, some of them, you know, 20 times because I'm pretty thick. I've had the right colour hair for that. You know, you can go, oh, can't do it. <laughs> but if you really stick with a manual, you can get to the bottom of it. And so God's saying, my word might be a little bit of a challenge sometimes, but it's worth it to dig in because it's, it's my word. I created you. I redeemed you. It's my word. Dig in, you know. Put on your big boy pants, read it again, get a commentary, get a dictionary. Try to understand it because it's my word. And it is written that you are who you are because of me and I want you to focus on who I am. And because there's a future judgment, verse 17, final reckoning, God's light at the end of the tunnel... And in 1 Corinthians 4, it says, Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring the light that is hidden in the darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their promise from God. So there's something in the future. One day, God's going to scratch his chin and have a look at the way you did stuff. Not in judgment. Of, of harshness, but in a, a, a judgment of love, I gave you life. I gave everything for you. You were the most valuable commodity. I gave my son's blood for you. What have you done with that? Did you take it for granted? Did you try and bleach all the the yuck out of it? Did you try and short change somehow? Did you worship me when 
people were around that were important and then turned you back and did something else when they weren't? Did you maximise every opportunity to share the light? Did you do that? So one day he's going to look at what did you do with what I gave you? So there is something in the future that we have to wait till it plays out. So I want you to know that you're valuable. If you keep reading through to verse 22, I think, um, you find out your great value, that the precious blood of Jesus was shared for you. In verse 19, and, and there's a couple of things. It says Christ un spotless and unblemished was a lamb that was like that so there's two things about those words spotless and unblemished so why does he use those those words spotless is an acquired defect right so if you get spots on your jumper or you kind of did that from going around doing whatever you do spilling your tomato sauce out of your burger or whatever but if you have a blemish, blemish, then that's an inherent defect. So Jesus was not was both. He didn't acquire any spots on his journey here, and he lived a spotless life. And his blood places huge value. Um, the blood of the Lamb, right through the Old Testament, has been the most valuable thing. Jesus' blood was enough. Remember, in the Old Testament, it was one lamb to one person one lamb to one family. But when Jesus came along, it was one lamb to the whole world. Just tells you the power of that blood that was shed. You are precious in his sight. Don't ever lose, lose that. Don't ever, ever underestimate that that blood was just poured out for you and was so, so important. So you're precious. You were predestined by God's plan. This was part of God's plan. You weren't an afterthought. From the very beginning, he planned to redeem you. And you are called to do something. And that's where we stand right now. We learnt from verses 1 to 12 that we were important and valued and special and we had an inheritance that could never be taken away from it. Amazing stuff. But what do we do with it? We are children of the light as God's precious children, as God's children that are called to something. We're called to believe. We're called to trust what he says. And then we're asked to make differences of where we stand. We're asked to be the light every day. And whether it's a day when we're in lockdown and you're stuck at home and it could be a phone call, or whether it's when you go to work and you're the one who smiles when everyone else is grumpy, when you're the one who sees past somebody's bad demeanour and grumpy status and extends love and understanding. Most people who hurt have been hurt. Um, it is the Christian that bridges gaps in all of that. And when you meet others, um, and it would be interesting if you go around and ask me what holiness means. It would be a really interesting exercise because you'd have all sorts of things. But the best way that we can experience holiness is to show it to others. God is holy. What's that mean? Let me show you. And it's through your love, extending your arms to tough situations, being a light in a dark place. And that's what we're called to do. Why? Because we have everything. God could not do one more thing better than what he's already done. On the cross, everything that happened in the past, everything that's happening right now in this room and everything that will happen in the future was taken there. And it's enough. It's enough for you. It's enough for me. It's enough for every person on the planet. All they have to do is say yes and then shine their light and use these beautiful lips for good. Use these brains, these eyes, these hands, these feet to demonstrate the holy, holiness and the light. And let's poke holes in the dark. Are you with me? Let's poke some holes. I want to poke some holes. God bless you. <laughs>